Good morning. Would you stand with us? Um, as, before we start, you guys know there were lots of tornadoes uh, a couple nights ago. Um, and some people have asked me, so Paducah, Kentucky, where I'm from, it's good, we're good. Mayfield, Kentucky is our next door neighbor, and Mayfield is destroyed. Um, so we've got some friends and family that from that area. Um, so if you will just be praying, I'm sure you've already been praying for everybody, but um, it's hard. But God is good, amen? So let's worship together. Let's sing this together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song. Bless the Lord. So bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship Your. in love. Oh, 
so good to us. You're so great and kind and merciful and loving towards us. We thank you for your, your love and for the sacrifice that you have made for us. Now we get to celebrate the season of remembering your birth to come into this world to save us. And we look forward to Easter when we can celebrate again the resurrection and the redemption and the finality of what you've done in our our rescue. We praise you for that, Lord. We pray for uh, Jason as he comes and teaches your word today, Lord. Help us to learn more about you and become more like you today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, you can begin turning with me to Genesis chapter 23, where we'll be picking up and going through the book of Genesis. Now you may be thinking like, wow, I can't wait to see how he's going to tie in Genesis chapter 23 and 24 into Christmas. Me too. We'll find out. Let's see what we can do. But what we're going to look at today through those chapters, we're going to recap a lot of things. We're not going to read all those verses this morning. But what we're looking at is the idea of trusting God's Word, and that when it comes down to trust, trust is an action verb. Okay, you can say all day long that you trust something, but until you act upon it, it's very empty. Trust is an action word. Basically, it's faith in action. All right, trust is something you do, it should cause a response. If you're not responding with an action, it's not really trust. All right, and so with that in mind, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 23. Basically what's happening here, we're going to recap the first 13 verses or so. We have Sarah, who Abraham's wife, of a, she has passed away after 127 years. She dies in Hebron, which is the land of Canaan. And so Abraham goes to get a burial place for her in that land from the Hittites. Um, at this point, Abraham is about 137. Isaac is about 37. And if you remember the Hittites, all the way back in Genesis chapter 10, they are the descendants of Canaan. All right, And so they come from that line of Canaan, the cursed line of Canaan that we read about in Genesis um, earlier in chapter 10. And so you have the Hittites, Abraham's working with them. One of the more famous Hittites that you read about later in the Bible is Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. You know, one of David's mighty men. And so the Hittites play a, kind of a big role in the life of Israel and the Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all them. And, but most of the time they're enemies. But we have a couple of moments where they kind of get along a little bit. You have this one here where he, they work out the burial land for Abraham, for his wife Sarah. And then later you'll see Uriah fighting along beside David. But picking up in verses 14 through 20. Is, is where we'll read, beginning. So Genesis chapter 23, verse 14, it says, Ephraim answered Abraham and said to him, My Lord, listen to me. Land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed with Ephraim, and Abraham weighed out to Ephraim the silver that he had agreed to in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 standard shekels of silver. So Ephron's field at Mechpelah near Mamre, the field with its cave and all the trees anywhere within the boundaries of the field became Abraham's possessions in the sight of the Hittites who came to the gate of his city, of this city. After this, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field of Machpelah near Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field with its cave passed from the Hittites to Abraham as burial property. Now, Abraham burying Sarah... In Hebron, in the land of Canaan, is very, very significant. And you're like, well, why is that so significant? Well, typically, when loved ones pass away, you tend to bury them with their family. You know, you say you're from somewhere. That's kind of where you go back to. Your fam previous family's been buried there. That's a natural, normal thing that 
tends to happen. We tend to bury people with their families, where they're from. But here, Abraham does not take Sarah back to her family where her family is buried. And that's very significant because God had told Abraham, this is the land that I'm giving you. This is the land of promise for you and for your offspring. And so by Abraham burying Sarah in that land, not with her family, but a fresh new burial plot, he's saying, Lord, I'm trusting that this is where you have called our family to be. And so with his actions here, we're seeing Abraham trust God's word by living in the land of promise and burying his wife there. Again, we see that trust, that trust in action. He trusted the word of God, and so he acted upon it and put her there. Now we're going to pick up in chapter 24. So in chapter 24, verse 1 through 9, it says, Abraham was now old, getting on in years, and the Lord had blessed him in everything. Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household, who managed all, his, all he owned, Place your hand under my thigh, and I will have you swear by the Lord, God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife or my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to the land of my family to take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me in this land. Should I have your son go back to the land you came from? Abraham answered him, Make sure that you don't take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from my native land, who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your offspring. He will send an angel before you, and you can take a wife from my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath to me, but don't let my son go back there. So the servant placed his hand under his master Abraham's thigh and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. So first we saw Abraham bury his wife Sarah there in the land of Canaan. And then now we see him refusing to let his son go back to where his fathers were from. Back to where his family, cousins and relatives and all those back to that land. He is saying, no, my son must stay here. Again, Abraham is trusting the word of God and he's saying, look, I understand that this is the land of promise. This is where I need to be. And this is where my offspring needs to be, my son. So don't let him go back. Make him stay in the land of promise. I think Abraham has been learning his lesson a little bit. Remember, every chance he, he fled to Egypt and he did all these different things to his life. He was very impulsive. But at this point, he's a lot less impulsive. And he's showing a little bit more of that patient obedience to the word of God. We see him maturing in his faith. Not only is he trying to walk in the word of the Lord and be obedient, but he's desiring for his offspring, the next generation, to walk in the word of the Lord as well. But the key to all this is Abraham being obedient to the word of God. That is the key to this whole thing of Abraham's faith maturing is obedience to the word of God. God never told him to flee to Egypt. God never told him to lie about Sarah being his sister. Every time he stepped out on his own, problems came. But Abraham has been learning. He's re been repenting. He's been worshiping. And now we see where he is just, okay, I am set on following the word of God no matter what. And so he says twice, don't let my son go back there. Because he knows if his son goes back there, he's going to end up seeing family, friends. It's going to be a lot easier life. I mean, it's hard moving to a place where you know nobody, right? It's just a, it's a, it's a difficult transition. And so he's just got there. I, you know, they're, they're new in the land. If he goes back to where everything's easy and comfortable, Isaac may forsake the word of God and not come back to the land of promise. So we are seeing here Abraham trust God's word by keeping his son in the promised land. Again, his trust is revealed in actions. And then we see God's faithfulness revealed here in the next few verses of verse 10 through 27. And I'm going to recap that. So um, what you have is you have the servant who is sent to go get a, a wife for Isaac. And he goes and he goes back to um, Abraham's hometown area and where there's other people that are worshiping the Lord, which is a big deal. See, the land of Canaan, they were pagans. And so Abraham's like, I don't want a pagan wife 
for my son, I want you to go to the land there where we're from and get someone who worships the Lord. All right, and so that was very important to him. And so he goes, the servant goes and says, well, how will I know if this is the Lord or whatnot? And so verse 12 of 24 says, Lord, God of my master Abraham, he prayed, make this happen for me today and show kindness to my master Abraham. I am standing here at the spring where the daughters of the men of the town are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I say, please lower your water jug so that I may drink, and who responds, drink, and I'll water your camels also. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my servant. And then before he had finished speaking, Rebecca shows up. Right, and so he's, he's prayed, and we see the faithfulness of the Lord in this moment. Rebecca comes up, and he says, hey, will you please give me some water? And she says, yes, and I'll get water for your camels also. And then he knows this is the one. See, when God calls us to do something, he will always be faithful to follow through. And I think it's very interesting that the servant of the Lord, he goes out and he prays to God. And he, and he speaks to God. And I think that what has happened is this servant has learned from watching Abraham all these years. He's seen Abraham call on the name of the Lord. He's seen Abraham repent and trust the Lord. And he's seen all these things. And now you see the servant almost kind of doing the same thing. Calling out to the Lord. Lord, show me what I must do. And then we see the servant also responds with worship as well, just as Abraham, Abraham had done. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, we see that Abraham has directly impacted his servant. Now his servant is copying his faithfulness to God. But again, what we're seeing is we're seeing patient obedience at work. Abraham and his servant, they understood. All right, God has this land for me and my offspring, but my son needs a wife, but she doesn't need a pagan wife. She needs a wife who fears the Lord, and so he goes to get that wife for his son. I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing Abraham's faith maturing. See, earlier... Abraham wasn't so patient, and he took Hagar as his wife to have Ishmael. But we don't see Abraham's, like, rush to action here by saying, oh, I need to get a, I'm, a, I'm getting older in age, I need to get a wife for, for my son, and so just get a Canaanite woman, just go get someone real quick. His faith is maturing, he's not making the same mistakes. See, repentance is very important because repentance is something that is unique. All right, sorrow, guilt, shame, remorse, all those things, those things are not repentance. You can feel guilty but never repent. You can feel sorrow, remorse, and shame but actually never repent. Repentance is a change of action. It's a change of lifestyle to try to get away from the sin that you are committing. See, often we hear people you know, say, oh, I'm so sorry, but they keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. They're not repenting, they're just sorry, not the same thing. Here we see Abraham's repenting. Throughout his life, we see he's not making the same mistakes over and over and over again. He's changing his lifestyle so that he cannot fall into those same temptations. He's not rushing to get some wife for his son. He's like patient obedience we will go get a we will go get the right wife from the right place at the right time very different than we saw with hagar he's maturing in his faith you cannot mature in your faith without repentance repentance must play a part in your life so we're seeing abraham and his servants trust god's word by going to seek a godly wife for isaac we see repentance at work, we see them worshiping, and we see those things happening. And so this story of this, Rebecca came out and did all these things, watered the camels, all this stuff, and the servant's like, wow, this, she did exactly what the Lord uh, you know, said she would do. And so they go back to Rebecca's home, and in verses 28 through 54, they, re re they retell the story to Bethuel and Laban. 
We're not going to read all those verses, but it's the same story. I, I prayed to the Lord that, you know, when they come out to water, the one I say, will you give me some water? They will water my camels as well. And she did that and all that kind of stuff. And it's from the Lord. And they re -explain, retell all the story. And then we see Laban and Bethuel's response in verses 50 through 54 of Genesis 24. It says, Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We have no choice in the matter. Rebekah is here in front of you. Take her and go. Let her be a wife to your master's son, just as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard this words, he bowed to the ground before the Lord. Then he brought out objects of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious gifts to her brother and her mother. Then he and the men with them ate and drank and spent the night. When they got up in the morning, he said, send me to my master. Very interesting phrase here. Laban and Bethuel answer when they hear this story about Rebekah and Abraham's servant. It says, this is from the Lord. We have no choice in the matter. When the Lord speaks... We have no choice in the matter. See, I know that we live in America where we get to vote, we get to have a say, we have representatives, and you know, we always feel like our voice needs to be heard. But when it comes to the Word of God, it's not a democracy. See, He is the King, and we are His servants. If the King speaks it, there's no changing it. There's no challenging it, there's no manipulating it, rewording it. If the king speaks, it is so. We see this even in the book of Acts later, even with the Pharisees, they understood this concept. In Acts 5, 38 through 39, it says, So in the present, present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or his work of human origins, it'll fail. But if it, uh, but if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. See, if God says it, and God determines it, and God sets it out, nothing we can do to change it. All we can do is find ourselves fighting against God. And Laban and Bethuel in this moment kind of understood that, hey, this is of God, it's going to happen. And so when God's word speaks, we should just follow we should get along with what God is wanting to accomplish. Because he's going to accomplish it. With or without us. We can fight against him all we want. But God is going to accomplish what he has set out to accomplish. We can't change it. We can't stop it. And so we see here that even Laban and Bethuel trust God's word by submitting to sending Rebekah to Isaac. Again, we see their trust produced action. And then to close out... This, this section, in verses 55 through 61, we see Rebekah's faith and trust in the Lord as well. So verses 55 through 61. But her brother and mother said, Let the girl stay with us for about ten days, then she can go. But he responded to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has made my journey a success. Send me away so that I may go to my master. So they said, Let's call the girl and ask her opinion. They called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She replied, I will go. So they sent away her sis their sister, Rebekah, with the one who had nursed and raised her, and Abraham's servant, and his men. They blessed Rebekah, saying to her, Our sister, may you become thousands upon ten thousands. May your offspring possess the city gates of their enemies. Then Rebekah and her female servants got up, mounted the donkeys, and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Again, Abraham wanted his servant to go back to his hometown and say, I want you to find a, a wife for my son Isaac. Why? Because he wanted a wife for Isaac who was a believer in God, not for one of the pagan Canaanites. And so he sends him back, and then you see Rebecca truly is a follower of God. She trusts in God. Now, this might poke a little bit at the current dating scene of our culture. But Isaac 
and Rebecca never met and are getting married. Moral of the story, the parents should always choose the spouse. <laughs> Period. God has spoken how it should be, right? No, so but what you have here is you have, so you go back, what mattered the most in this moment? They're going to come together, they're going to be married. What mattered the most? What mattered is that they worshipped the Lord. Possessions, titles, status, looks, those type of things didn't matter. What mattered, the first priority was someone who worshipped the Lord. Someone who feared the Lord. And if you're single, that's the primary thing. Are they serving the Lord? Are they seeking after the Lord with all of their heart? If they're not, move on. Period. The Bible speaks to this many, many, many times throughout Scripture. We're not to be unequally yoked. We're not to come together. Believers and unbelievers aren't to be married. All those type of things. If you're single, first thing, are they worshiping the Lord? Are they sold out for Him? Not do they go to church or claim God, but are they living for God? See, here we see Rebecca. She is living out her faith. God said, go. She said, okay. Similar story to Abraham. Abraham was just like, hey, get it. God said to Abraham, get up and go to a place I'll show you. And he just gets up and go. Comes to Rebecca. Rebecca, get up and go to a place that I'm going to show you with a new husband and all this stuff. And she's like, okay. And she gets up and goes. That type of faith just doesn't necessarily happen overnight. It's a maturing. It's a, as you obey the word of God over time, your trust and your faith and all this stuff grows. Trusting the word of God takes time. And it takes these little acts of obedience and stepping out in faith and trusting what God's word says. And over time, it leads you to places that you never thought you could go. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard people over the years in church and be like, when you hear about missionaries and all these remote places doing all these things, like, oh, I can never do that. I'm like, you realize those missionaries are just people. Just like us. Same thing. But what it is, they take these little steps of faith over time, trusting the word so much so that when God said, go to a place I will show you, they're like, okay, I'll go. Because they've trusted over time. It's a maturing of faith. And I want us to think about that maturing of faith by closing out with Philippians chapter 3. So if you want to turn there, you can. But Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21 First, we'll start with verses 12 through 14. This is Paul speaking to the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Not that I've already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have, also, I have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. This idea of maturing in faith. I think we've seen Abraham maturing in his faith throughout Genesis. And Paul talks about this maturing in faith. And one of the things he talks about is forgetting what is behind and pressing on. The idea of forgetting what is behind, what Paul is talking about. Look, your life without Christ, the things of the world, the priorities of this world, the, the less, all, no. Lay all that aside and press on to what God has for you. Reaching forward to what? God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. What is God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus? Why did Jesus come? What was he calling people to? A relationship with their heavenly father. What are you pressing on towards? A relationship with your heavenly father. That's what all of this life is about. You pressing on to that relationship. See, our goal is not a place. Heaven is not our goal. Our goal is God himself. Because heaven as we know it now is going to be done away with. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and all those things. We're not pressing towards a place. We're pressing towards a person. We're not pressing towards a status, to a certain level of living, or all these things. We're pressing towards a person. We forget what all this world has to offer because we're pressing on to a person, God himself. 
And that's going to be ultimately realized in Revelation 21.3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. The glories of eternity is God himself. That is the great prize. That is what we're pressing towards, God himself. That's what we're we're forgetting what was behind and pressing on towards God himself. So part of your maturing in your faith is you're pressing on to know God more intimately and deeply. And then verses 15 through 17, picking up in Philippians 3. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. In any case, we should live up to whatever truth we have attained. Joining, join in imitating me, brothers and sisters, and pay careful attention to those who live according to the example you have in us. That phrase, live up to the truth you have attained. What he's saying here is like, look, as you learn things about God, put it to practice. Don't wait. You learn something, put it to practice. And then as you learn more, you put it to practice. As you learn more, put it to practice. That's part of maturing in your faith is as you grow, you put things into practice. You just have to. It'd be like a mechanic, okay? You want to become a mechanic. And what you do is you watch a bunch of YouTube videos over and over and over again, but you never actually do anything. Are you really progressing? Are you really becoming a great mechanic? No, you got to actually start doing things. You learn something, you do it. You learn something, you do it. That's how life works. I can watch all the YouTube videos I want, and then if I go out to hunt, and I've never fired a gun, and I've never had to sit in a blind, and I've never had to track a deer, guess what? It's not probably going to turn out well. It's probably going to be a big disappointment. Because you have to learn something, put it to practice. Learn something, put it to practice. And that's what Paul is saying here. As you learn things from God's word, don't set that aside. Put it to practice so that you can learn the next thing and the next thing so that you can continue to mature in your faith. And it says, look, and if you're struggling, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He says, I'm just pressing on. I'm trying to press on. I'm trying to mature. Find people in your life that you can follow through life with. We were never intended to do life alone or to have our faith alone. We are intended to be part of a body that pushes each other, that cares for one another, that bears one another's burdens, that encourages, pushes, and challenges, keeps accountable. We need each other to help press us on so we can be reminded, hey, we need to forget the things that are behind and press on to God himself. See, the vast majority of issues that people face today like whether it's marriage or parenting or work, all those type of things. Many of those problems, not all, but the vast majority of those problems typically come into our life when we've lost focus on pursuing God himself. I've seen it time and time again. When you individually stop pressing on and know, to know God more intimately, to have a deeper relationship with him, man, things start to crumble around you a little bit. So we need to press on. Find people you can walk through life with. And then verses 18 through 21 of Philippians 3. says, For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is their shame. They are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So he concludes this little section here about maturing in your faith by contrasting two types of people. He said there's those that are enemies of the cross and then those are citizens of heaven. Look at the the enemies of the cross. They're in his destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They are focused on earthly things. It lists all these things. If They're loving the world. They're not putting aside the things of the past and pressing on. They're embracing the world. They're worldly. They're concerned about the things this world has to offer them. Those are the enemies of the cross. Those are the description Paul uses to describe that. And then look at the description he uses to describe those citizens of heaven. 
They eagerly wait for the Savior Jesus. A person. It's like he said, forgetting what is behind and pressing on to God himself. That's what separates the enemies of the cross and Christians. The enemies of the cross are about stuff. The people of God are about a person. Big difference. The Bible draws that contrast over and over and over again. And so what we see in maturing in our faith, we see, we've seen Abraham maturing. How is he maturing? He's leaving what was behind, and he's pressing on to a person. It was true for Abraham, it was true for Paul, and it's true for us today. The only way for us to mature in our faith is forgetting what is behind and pressing on to a person, to God himself. That's what this whole life is about, knowing him. Now, how are we going to tie this into Christmas and all that kind of stuff? I don't know. You're super creative. You'll have to do that in your mind. But if you want to mature in your faith, go after God himself. And how do you go after him? He's given you his word so that you may know him. Get into the word of God. Just like Abraham his servant, Rebekah, Bethuel, Laban, the, word, the Lord has spoken, and we will follow. The Lord has spoken through his word. He has given us his very word so that we can know him. So go to the Bible, not for stuff, but for a person. Read the Bible so that you may know him and go after him. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this morning and this time you've given us again to come to worship. Help us to be reminded that we are to trust your word. Help us remember that trust is an action. Help us to read your word so that we can know you and so that we can follow after you and and who you have called us to be. Help us to forget what the world has said or what the world is offering. Help us to lay all that aside and press on to knowing you. Help us to remember that you are our greatest treasure. You are the prize. You are our goal to be with you. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here today who has never surrendered their life to you. Father, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Spirit, we ask that you would bring such conviction upon them that they can do nothing else but surrender their life to you. And that they would cry out in repentance and belief. Father, for those of us who do believe, help us to leave the things of the world behind and to press on to you taking what we learn, putting it to action, trusting and following you wherever you may call us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, we're gonna stand and we're gonna sing and continue in worship. But I would encourage you not to leave this place until you're ready to submit all of yourself to God himself. Until you're ready to pursue him Not things, not a place, but a person, God himself. Let's stand and let's sing. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? 
Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar Behind your regrets and mistakes. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes and Life is born, Jesus is calling. Oh, come, oh, come to the altar. Savior, and oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful, sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, bow down before him, and bow down before Lord of all, sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. You may be seated.